the rest of the story. It was an easy caller. After all, the perpetrator, one Robert Cutter, was only 11 years young. And still the punks in that Philadelphia neighborhood had been stealing and dealing more than usual, especially since April, so the cops had to crack down on criminals of every size. And on that particular July afternoon, Bobby Cotter was swept up in the inexorable dragnet. He'd been spotted fleeing the scene on foot, but the authorities poised, pounced, arrested the boy in possession of stolen goods. Police questioned the owners of the pilfered property, ascertained that it was indeed theirs, that's all the cops had to know. Bobby was going downtown. Mrs. Cotter, the boy's mother, was near frantic. What did they mean, she kept insisting at precinct headquarters? What did they mean that her baby had to spend the night in jail? Well, that was precisely what they meant. And it was further suggested that maybe a few hours in the lockup would do the little hoodlum some good. Put him in the right frame of mind for the arraignment the following morning. And so trying to conceal her sadness and especially her fear, Mrs. Cotter hugged Bobby goodbye, returned home. It was a long, lonely night during which the lad pondered his crime. Maybe the judge would go easy. After all, possession was nowhere near as bad as dealing, and the kids had been dealing plenty in that neighborhood where Bobby had been nabbed. Next morning, the youngster was hustled from his cell, taken to court, the Honorable Charles Lincoln Brown presiding. As the facts were presented, Judge Brown scowled in silence. He seemed so angry that Bobby feared the stiffest possible sentence might be handed him. And indeed, after testimony had been given, after each side had rested its case, the judge folded his arms, he leaned back in his chair, and he said... I have experienced virtually every emotion in my career as a jurist. Joy and sorrow, hope and despair, all of them. But he said, seldom in all of my years at this bench have I been more infuriated than this morning, or have I been more disappointed than I am now in the plaintiffs. Bobby, who had been staring ashamedly at the floor, suddenly looked up. Had he misunderstood? No, he had not. Judge Brown was glaring directly at the man representing the owners of the property which he, Bobby, had stolen. The defendant, Judge Brown continued, was simply following his most natural instincts. In fact, I would have done the same thing in his place, said the judge. So my ruling is finders keepers, court adjourned. The astonished boy ran to the arms of his waiting mother. It was a landmark decision Judge Brown made that day, one so significant, so far-reaching, that all of these 76 years later, there remains a proud and prominent statue to him in a downtown Philadelphia courthouse. For as a result of his ruling and the widespread publicity which followed, not only did the local plaintiffs change their petty larceny policy, but similar businessmen all over the country soon did the same. For until the summer of 1922... Baseball fans were legally required to return baseballs hit into the stands. And the kids who caught and kept those balls or tried to sell them on the street for a quarter were considered criminals. But now you were there that Thursday morning in July of 1922 when a Philadelphia judge made America's pastime the fun it was supposed to be. For now you know the rest of the story.